Hi, I'm Claire Vachereau and today I'm going to talk about sneaking into buildings using the Building Management System protocol KNXNet IP. But first, a little bit about myself. Uh, I started as a software developer, uh, then moved to software security, and then to embedded and industrial devices and system security. Um, also in my job, I like penetration tests on unusual environments. And by unusual environments, I mean for instance, uh, factories, transportation systems, uh, amusement parks, and, and so on. Um, during these assessments, we often have new environments with unknown devices and protocols, and we usually don't know where to start. And this is what happened for me with Building Management System and uh, KNXNet IP. So just before we start, uh, a little disclaimer. Uh, testing industrial systems and building management systems can be dangerous, uh, they control physical process, uh, so it, they may have an impact on people's safety, causing accidents or disabling alerts. So please be careful. So during our assessments, we usually test on mock environments, or at least environments we, we control to avoid unwanted side effects. So now that said, let's talk about building management systems. Uh, you may have already heard of them, as this is uh, really not the first talk about building management systems. Um, but I don't feel it's yet the time to stop introducing them first, so here we go. So building management systems, or building automation systems, are systems that can control every component in a facility, uh, from lighting to security systems, including HVAC, sometimes elevators, and so on. Um, as their name suggests, they are used to automate these components uh, and to control them easily. And you can find them in all types of facilities, like homes, factories, hospitals, and so on. So here is an inter interesting example from the movie Hackers, uh, which has a, a BMS hacking scene. Um, the main character hacks into his school BMS interface and uh, he, he schedules the sprinkler system uh, to run at a certain time uh, basically for revenge. And uh, this is what happens. So I don't know how it was back in 1995, but now, apart from this weird 3D interface, this is quite a workable scenario. Uh, we can definitely do this, provided, of course, that the sprinkler system is linked to the, to the building management system. So now let's take a closer look at, at this technically. Um, in BMS, uh, the main part is the field part, uh, where the actual components are. Uh, we often find three types of components, sensors, actuators, and controllers. Uh, if we take the, the example from hackers, a uh, sensor could be a fire detector, uh, the actuators uh, could be the sprinklers, and, and so on. So they communicate, these devices communicate with each other using field bus protocols. Um, usually on twisted pairs or radio frequencies. So this part can work standalone. And in fact, before it was the only part. But then the field part got connected to the IP network. Um, first because there's that train to connect everything, but also most probably so that operators could reach and control them more easily. So basically, there are additional devices that we'll call IP interfaces or gateways or server or whatever. And uh, this IP interfaces makes a translation between the IP world and the field world. So to simplify, the operator just needs to be on the same network as this IP interface uh, to configure and control the field part. So in a way, we expose components that used to be only reachable physically to anyone on the network or even the internet. And that's interesting for us, and uh, we may definitely want to take a look at it from a security point of view. So in industrial and building management system, many software and protocol were created before we started talking about cybersecurity, or they were created without considering that they may be exposed someday, and they are usually meant to last for a long time. So some of them do cover safety measures, uh, which are prevention against involuntary failures, but they don't cover security issues. They don't cover provoked error. Uh, for instance, uh, they don't prevent from forging or replaying packets. And it's also quite common to find configuration flaws on them, uh, such as default credentials 
or only one user, which is used to run everything on a device and its root, uh, and so on. So see, there's a lot of things to think about when it comes to industrial systems and building management system security. But there's more. So let's take an even closer look at the interface between the LAN and the field. So it's usually a device in an electric cabinet, so it means that it's hardly reachable physically, uh, but of course reachable from the LAN. And if you scan one of them, you may notice that several services are running, like first the usual stuff for administration, uh, most likely at least HTTP, maybe SSI, SSH or any other. Um, but you may also notice another port, which is the building management system protocol service. Uh, what are they? As I said before, field components communicate with each other using a field protocol. Some of them now have an IP layer, uh, which means that you can contact interface and field devices uh, directly using the IP version of this protocol. Um, the most too common of such protocol being BACnet and KNX. So what happens is that the operator will send a BACnet IP or KNXnet IP request to the interface, which will interpret it and relay it uh, to the field bus um, via uh, field BACnet or field KNX uh, requests. And today I want to focus on that part for several reasons. Uh, first, because we already know the other services and you can at least expect some basic protections from the vendor, uh, which is not necessarily true for the BMS protocol. And more importantly, uh, this protocol is a direct way to talk to devices. It's the best way to gather information and to run commands on the BMS. And finally, they have the same flaws as many other industrial components. Uh, protocols do not consider cybersecurity and a lot of implementation were written a long time ago and never updated since then. What do we have so far? So we have field devices and protocol uh, that should not be exposed. Uh, and we know that they are actually are, and that we can reach them via IP interface devices. Uh, we also know that there's this IP version of a field protocol no one has heard of before to do that. And finally, uh, we know that we can talk to devices directly using that IP version of a BMS protocol through that IP gateway. Yeah. But what can we do with that? So in the next few slides, I talk about two general attack scenarios on building management systems. Uh, the first one consisting in sending valid stuff on the IP interface using the, B the BMS protocol. And the second one consisting in sending invalid stuff, which is brilliant, I know. So let's talk about the first one, which is the most obvious one. Uh, here we want to send legitimate commands to change the BMS behaviors. Um, if we go back to the example from hackers, uh, we could, for instance, enable sprinklers, which may or may not be fun, depending on the situation. Uh, we could disable the fire detection, which is not fun at all. Um, in a trickier way, uh, we could also change thresholds. Uh, for instance, uh, by setting the smoke detector thresholds higher, uh, when an alert is triggered, it may already be too late, which is still not fun. Um, or you can just do whatever you want, as long as it's allowed by the system, and this is very important. And why can we do that? Uh, because as I mentioned before, uh, these protocols do not cope with cybersecurity. Uh, there is no protection against replay or whatsoever, and often no authentication, or at least no authentication by default. So here is a small example I did a few months ago. Uh, this is an HVAC system in a test environment, which, which can be controlled with BACnet. So I have no idea what's inside the BACnet protocol, but just by listening to the traffic and extracting the right frame, uh, I was able to make it unavailable. So this is the script I used. Um, this, it just replays uh, the command to turn the system off every one second, and that's enough. And by doing this in a real environment, this could have a really bad effect. 
Uh, for instance, in a data center, without the HVAC, the servers would just cover it to death. Also, in buildings made entirely of glass, uh, what happens if you turn the HVAC off? Also, imagine in Vegas. And for the, the air re renewing part, if it's turned off, all the bad things would stay in the air, which is really not suitable, uh, especially during a pandemic. So the other scenario is the unintended use of devices using these protocols. In scenario one, we run legitimate commands and can only perform expected operations. Here we want to send malicious stuff and wait for something unexpected, most likely something you could exploit. And what makes it happen is, of course, the combination of security issues on these devices that we talked about previously. Um, but it's even easier knowing that a lot of BMS IP interfaces uh, run Linux-based operating systems. So here is an example of what you can do. Uh, if, for instance, you can compromise uh, an IP interface exposed on the internet, from the internet, uh, you could gain a foothold in the network and possibly keep it, or move somewhere else on that network, or do anything else on that network. An alternative to this scenario could be to use the, the BMS for network pivoting. Uh, for instance, in industrial systems, IT and OT networks should be segregated. They are not always segregated, but at least they should be. So now imagine having a BMS that's connected to both. Um, I'm not saying this is a common setting, but it can definitely happen. So someone who has access to the IT and wants to move to the OT uh, would probably consider compromising devices that are connected to both. So this is it for the scenario. Um, of course, I didn't invent any of this. And uh, if you want to know more about BMS in general, there are already a few conferences and paper. Uh, also, there are already a few talks about BMS exploitation. Um, and among them, I recommend the one by Jesus Molina at DEFCON 22, uh, which talks about uh, abusing a Canix system in a hotel and which is really good. Also, there is already some work about advanced testing on BACnet systems and research about attack detection and remediation on BACnet. But as you can see, this is really all about BACnet, so where's Canix? <laughs> Actually, the scenario that we just went through can be applied to any building management system protocol that has an IP layer. So there's, of course, Backnest, but there's also Canix, and we don't know much about it from an offensive point of view. So in the context of everything that we've just seen, uh, we're going to focus on that protocol for the rest of the presentation. So let's talk about Canix. So as you already know, uh, KNX is a BMS protocol with an IP layer. Um, it's mostly used in Europe and Asia, whereas BACnet is mostly used in the US. And of course, like the other, you can find it in all types of homes and, and buildings. For instance, in my office, the lights and, and shutters are operated by KNX. So i just like to say a few words about its history because I think it's interesting to understand sh some choices they made about the protocol. So basically, it's a merge of three European field protocol standards that were used uh, since the 80s. And they were merged into KNX in 1999. Uh, then, eight years later, KNX NetIP was created, and uh, then the KNX installation became reachable from the network. And then again, six years later, uh, security came. <laughs> the first KNX NetIP security extension came out. Um, and finally, it's important to note that this standard is only free since 2016, so that's only been five years, which is not that long. <laughs> but even with the specifications available, they're still pretty hard to use, and I'll get back to it later. Um, there are a few external documentation and also a few research and work about scanning security. But obviously that does not mean there is nothing to say about it. And actually, there's a lot to say. <laughs> but the standard got it covered. 
They say, for KNX, security is a minor concern, as any breach of security requires local access to the network. But that does not mean there is nothing uh, about security in KNX, as some vendors implement authentication, not all of them, but this is usually an option uh, which is usually disabled by default. Um, also, there are security protection. Uh, I mentioned uh, extensions, um, which are KNX IP secure and KNX data secure. But once again, there are extensions, there are add-ons, and you usually have to pay more or to get better devices to have them. So yeah, security is optional. And about the devices exposed on Shodan, I'm not saying that none of them use authentication or security extensions. But I'm just saying that most of them probably don't. But then, the standard got that covered too. Uh, they say, it is quite unlikely that legitimate users of a network would have the means to intercept, decipher, and then tamper with the KNX net IP without excessive study of the KNX specifications. So, this is what we call security by obscurity, and that's bad. So, KNX, hold my beer. So now let's get started. Let's start testing KNX. <laughs> the, the standard is right about one thing. The protocol is complicated, we have few resources, and it's hard to, to start testing KNX, really. So at least now the specifications are free, but and you just need an account on Canix websites. But you also need good nerves because the specification is 148 PDF files in 10 sections with information spread everywhere. So you just don't know where to find what you need and you can grab as any you need. That's a nightmare. <laughs> and most likely you only need the volume three, but it's still 33 PDF files with information spread everywhere again. And for instance, if you're looking for how to build a request, to send a value to an address, you need at least four different PDF files. <laughs> so we don't want to do that. And there's a better way to get things started. We could set up a test environment with three tools uh, provided by the KNX Association. So we could use KNX Virtual to emulate a KNX environment uh, that will um, combine with ETS, uh, which is the official engineering tool to configure KNX environments. So you just set up that environment, and then you just have to play with that while listening to the traffic, and you'll learn a lot. And this is all virtual, so no side effects here. And also, Wireshark already has a KNX IP, net IP dissector, which is really convenient. And uh, also, I have to say that the code for the dissector is way more understandable than the specifications. So I show you briefly how it looks like. I have a project configured in ETS with lights and switches. Um, I downloaded it to KNX Virtual, and we can see that if I click on buttons, it turns on and off lights. So that's a very straightforward setup, but that's already enough to run a few things in a safe environment. And we can also run diagnostic on ETS and see what happens on Wireshark and, and so on. Just before we really start testing KNX, there are a few key concepts I like to mention uh, because they are useful to fully understand what's going on. So when an operator pushes a configuration or sends a command, a KNX NetIP request is sent to the KNX NetIP interface. Um, this frame may contain only KNX NetIP relevant information, or it can embed raw KNX data which is relayed to the KNX layer. So this KNX data uh, are called KEMI for Common External Messaging Interface. And they are independent KNX messages uh, with their own format inside the KNX NetIP request. So this means that they have their own headers, their own types, uh, their own bodies, and, and so on. So this also means that we don't have one protocol to test, but two, with different impacts depending on the one we target. And finally, a few words about the topology. Uh, when you're on the IP layer, of course, you use IP addresses. But uh, when you're on the KNX layer, there are two types of addresses. 
The first one is individual addresses, uh, which are used to refer to the device. And the other one is group addresses, which refer more to functions. So it's not a collection of devices, but more a collection of actions that devices can do. For instance, we can imagine that the fire detector and the sprinkler subscribe to the same group address. And when there's a fire, uh, the fire detector will uh, set the value 1 to the group address uh, associated to it. And when uh, that group address has the value 1, it just starts the sprinkler. So I know it's a bit hard to understand, but it comes with practice, trust me. And that's all we need to know for now, and now we can really start testing. There are already a few tools that we can use to do that. Uh, first, there's, of course, ETS. Uh, KNX Map is also a great tool if you want to, to discover devices and interact with them. Um, so let me show you quickly. Uh, you can just use KNX Map to scan IP interfaces on the network. And you can see that we don't need to know much about KNX to use KNX Map, which is cool. Uh, we can see from Wireshark that a lot of things happened. First, we we see that we need to send a connect request, then a tunneling request with a KME, uh, and so on, but we'll get back to it later. So there's KNX Map, but there's also uh, the KNX NetIP layer for SCAPI, which was written by my colleague, uh, Julien Bedel. It's not yet on a release, but it's at least merged to SCAPI Master, uh, so you can already use it. So thanks to, thanks to Julien and thanks to SCAPI maintainers for that. But both SCAPI and KNX map are suitable for basic interaction. However, when I wanted to start using them for my own test, I encountered some limitations. So first, KNX map is great if you don't know the protocol. Uh, but I could not use it to craft invalid frames. I could not modify uh, KNX map code to alter requests uh, without rewriting parts of it because they handle errors, <laughs> which is a good practice, but for fuzzing, we don't want that. For SCAPI, it's the opposite. Uh, you can't really use it if you don't know the protocol in details, um, but you can definitely use it to craft invalid frames. However, they can become really complicated, especially when they embed KME frames. And also, IP interfaces are very strict, usually, regarding the format. So when you fuzz, uh, you have to fuzz specific fields, uh, which can become really complicated, and the syntax can be really tough. So obviously, when nothing suits my need, it's time to write a new tool. Now I'm going to talk about Buff, which is the tool we wrote when I started using and testing KNX NetIP devices. So Buff is a Python free library that we wrote to discover, interact with, and test devices via the industrial network protocols. So I first created it for KNX NetIP, but we can add other protocols. For instance, we are currently adding Modbus support. So this is a library, so it's most likely meant to uh, write attack scripts to change devices' behaviors, or to test protocol implementation on devices. So if you recall the attack scenario I talked about earlier, about sending valid and invalid frames to KNX NetIP devices, uh, both has been written to do both. No joke. <laughs> and if you want to take a look at it, it's available on Orange Cyber Defense GitHub. To be honest, I wrote it for my own needs first, and I use it during pen tests for discovery and to send commands. But I also use it for vulnerability research on protocol implementations on devices. So I use both uh, to write dumb and, and not so dumb further, I can say they are smart, <laughs> and I'll give you an example of that soon. And the more I go further in my research, the more features I add in both to help me testing. So hopefully it's getting better and better. So before I show you how to use both for discovery and testing, uh, just a quick information about both internals, which I think is interesting. So the first version of both relied on JSON files for protocol implementation uh, because it was easy to add and change things in the protocol, but at one point we had too many limitations. So, and when I first presented both, I was asked, uh, why not use CAPI? Which is actually a good question. <laughs> and I was like, mm, now that you mentioned that, 
So long story short, uh, we ended up adding it to handle protocol implementations, but internally, uh, there's a wrapper around it in both so that we don't lose some of both capabilities uh, that were not compatible with Scapy's behaviors. However, we still let the user access the Scapy object directly within both if she wants. So if you want to know more about that, we detailed how and why we did that in the documentation. Now back to using both. Uh, as I mentioned before, both can be used for discovery, basic interaction, and advanced testing. So there are three ways to use both. Uh, the first is the higher level one, which requires no knowledge about the protocol. Um, there are just some functions in the library that can be called to perform basic operations on KNX installations. So for instance, this is my test setup. Here we want to turn on this light and fan, uh, which are linked to a switching actuator. So the actuator is linked to an IP gateway that makes it reachable from the local network. And I'm on that local network, so I can communicate with it using KNX net IP. So the actuator is subscribed to group address 111 uh, for the light and fan switching operations, both of them. Uh, when it's switched off, the value is zero, and when it's switched on, it's one. So if I write value one to group address 111 using the function group write, we can see that something happens. Then there's an intermediate usage which requires some basic knowledge about the protocol. Uh, for instance, uh, you could do the same thing as in the previous example, but you can use this level to have more control on the exchange and the frames you send. So, for instance, if you want to do the same thing, um, that's to say change uh, a value on devices, this is what happens. Uh, we send a KNX net IP frame to initiate a tunneling connection to the KNX layer. Uh, we then send a tunneling request uh, containing a raw KNX frame, a KEMI. Uh, here it's L data rec, which will be extracted and relayed to the KNX layer. The server responds with an ACK and also with a confirmation KNX uh, frame, to which we reply with an ACK, uh, because at least my test server is upset if I don't. And yes, it's UDP. So, Using both, we'll just write a script that does exactly that. Um, here, the tunneling request is just broken down so that you can see how it looks like. But there's also a direct method that can be called to, to initiate and send the request. The code actually looks like that. So let's try to, to switch everything on again. And success. If we use the group addresses that are attached to only one object in the KNX configuration, uh, we can also turn on and off objects on their own. Oh, and uh, also something went wrong when we were setting up the demo. Uh, so let me introduce you what I think is the first ever KNX operated gun. And the final level is the one used to build the other ones uh, that can be used to change everything in a frame. See, and this is the part I use for fuzzing. Now I'll just show you how to start writing a fuzzer with both. Uh, we won't talk about the results because this is not another conference about how we fuzz something to find buffer overflows, although both can be used to do that. And KNX IP interface usually have Linux-based OS with services in C or other compiled languages, so it's definitely something that can happen. Uh, but back to our fuzzer. Here I choose to write another type of frames because fuzzing tunneling request just writes bad configuration to test devices, so that's not the best way to start, I guess. So I want to mutate a configuration request. Uh, this means that I have my base frame uh, and I wrote a generator function that will set a random value to random field in that frame. I can just fuzz the whole frame because if the frame is not valid, it will be rejected by the IP interface before it's even processed. And here we don't want that because we are trying to cause errors while 
processing our frames. So I have to, to first mutate specific fields, um, not all of them, because some of them must remain valid uh, for the request to be accepted. The request, uh, the rest of the code handle the exchange with a similar process as for the tunneling request uh, with the hack and all. Um, and it will send my mutated KNXNLID frames. Uh, some of them may trigger some unexpected behaviors, uh, which we would want to test more afterwards to investigate. So here we want to first know uh, which field triggered a handled error uh, to exclude them later from the final results. And we also want to know which fields triggered timeout. Uh, that's to say frames that did not get an answer. That's they are, they are the most interesting one for us. So let's run it on a test device. Uh, you can see on Wireshark that a lot of packets are being sent and received. Um, at some point, we already have some results. All of them are timeouts. And um, for each one of them, I have um, the name of the field and the value that, may, that were mutated as well as um, a view of the complete frame. So the result we have show that Frames with some values in some fields did not get a response from the test device. So here we have six results. So this means that we have six potentially problematic fields that we will want to investigate. But at that point, there's one question. How do we know if the device rejected the frame or crashed while processing it? And the answer is, using only this, we don't. We could add an additional um, we could send an additional frame to check if the device just stopped responding. Um, but even when the device keeps on responding, that does not mean there was no crash. So the next thing to do is to add a debugger on the device and keep testing. But what do we expect to find then? So first of all, we expect to have crashes. Uh, that's to say situations where what we sent is not handled correctly and that we can investigate to eventually exploit them. But depending on when, on where the crash occurs, it may have different meaning. Um, if it's anywhere in a KNX IP frame, we can suspect that the service or any other software interpreting the frame uh, crashed and uh, that we can use it to possibly compromise the IP interface itself. But if there's an error in the KNX frame, it can also be that uh, it can also be on the KNX layer, uh, on the IP interface KNX layer, uh, that uh, a crash occurred leading to to the interface comp in, to the interface compromise. But it may also be on devices themselves. Um, however, it has never happened to me so far, so I might even be lying to you right now. <laughs> but investigating on this is exciting anyway. So it's time to wrap things up. But we have seen that there's a lot of things to do on BMS and KNX security. Uh, what we have so far is environments that control important stuff, but where security is a minor concern. So for now, we don't need to go really deep into hacking techniques, as there is no protection to bypass or a few of them. But even when there is, can we consider that building management systems that use KNX are secure? So apart from just abusing such systems, uh, we can go further, and there are a lot of research subjects left to work on here. Uh, for instance, to find out what's really inside widely used implementations and what we can do with them, or what's inside KNX security extensions, or even how to secure BMS efficiently and how to make sure they are actually secure. But until then, there are a few things that we can already do to make things better. So first, a quick message to vendors and users. Uh, stop assuming it's the other's problem. You both have your part to do in it. Uh, so vendors, please at least make sure that secure settings are default settings. And um, users, check those settings and segregate your network or at least don't expose your devices on internet. And for us, we have a brand new attack surface, so let's test it. Maybe someone will learn something. Just be careful when you do that and test in controlled environments. As for defenders, lucky you, you get a brand new defense surface. So that's all for me. I hope you enjoyed the presentation.
Thank you for listening.